Anyone else get angry sometimes? You just... Jesus got angry once. He actually upturned tables. Remember the story? He picked up the tables and he just started trashing. And it wasn't just the tables. It was everybody's law and order that they had on the tables went scattered as well. Um, because he just got sick and tired. The, 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 the temple was a, a place for people to meet with God and counter God. It was a house of prayer, he said, for all nations. He just turned it into something that's not. It's, it's not a trading place. There's a marketplace just around the corner down the road. Go down there and sell your wares. Go down there and do it. Where do you go from there? Huh? Where do you go from there? Is this it's all right, I can be honest. Yeah, I'm getting a couple of nods, a couple of people saying it's okay to be honest. The rest of you are still working it out. Look, that's okay. That's, that's completely okay. You know, I, uh, it's in the DNA of Arise, I guess. It's, we've always said it from day one. We're, 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 we didn't name the church Arise. It was a prophetic name that was given before we took it on. But it's symbolic of something. It means get up when you're down. Don't just lay there and be the same. Get up, move forward, recover, grow, get healthy, um, March. If you're looking for a gathering where, where you just, we just want to go on a Sunday and just feel nice, it's probably not the place for you long term here. It's just not going to be. And I don't say that disrespectfully for, for places, but everybody's got their flavour. Like I say, churches, Baskin Robbins, and every church has its particular flavour. And uh, we have a flavour, and that's our flavour. We're, we're not the best church in town, nowhere near it. But if you're meant to be here, I'll tell you this, we're the best church for you. We're the best gathering for you to be in if God wants you to be here. Um, but you know, if you're not growing and you don't like it, um, there's plenty of other places that, that we can be. But, but here's, here's what I've learned. Don't, don't go somewhere. Don't leave somewhere because it's uncomfortable. How many of you know that growth is uncomfortable? It is. It's about getting out of familiar territory, getting out of things we're comfortable with and used to. If you stay in that place that you're comfortable with, if you stay in the places you're used to, who goes to restaurants and all you ever do is order the same food every time? <laughs> yeah, see? Every time you go to that restaurant, you order the same meal. Well, guess what? You walk away and all you've done is reinforced what you already know. You've learned nothing else. Isn't that right? And so many Christians, we can be like that too. We just, we just keep reinforcing what we already know. So we find people that agree with us, they not, not challenge us. We read books that agree with us, not challenge us. We listen to people that totally agree with us, not challenge us. We go to restaurants, we eat the same meals, not in a meal that challenges us, like a nice spicy curry or something. Um, we, 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 we're just creatures of habit that find this smooth place of comfortability in life. And once we found that, we feel like the goal is comfort. But then God comes along and says, you know what? The goal's not comfort. The goal is growth and fruit. And you only grow fruit by going places you haven't been before, by learning new things, exposing yourself to new things. That's the process of growth. That's why uh, when kids are growing up, they call them growing pains because sometimes growing is painful. Isn't that right? Sometimes growth is painful. But we have a natural tendency as humans to avoid pain. We run away from pain, but we grow through pain. That's the purpose of the pains that we go through sometimes. So anyway, again, uh, I'm, I'm kind of digressing. Look, I want to dive really quickly into something. I don't have a lot of time, but I do want to, want to share some thoughts with you this morning. Last week, we started talking about uh, spiritual uh, about um, uh, uh, Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. And the truth of the matter is this, that, that, that we want to, uh, I, was, I was getting you to have a think about something. If you read the parable of the talents, it's, it's, it's not about, the, the master didn't give them a gift. He invested something in them. When we read this story, it's not about a gift, it's about an investment. We know that because when he came back, he went to settle accounts with them. Now, if, if it's a gift, if you feel like the things that are in your world are gifts, then it ends with you. You can do whatever you want. And the truth is, God actually has no uh, reason to expect anything further from you because it's a gift. When you give someone a gift, you walk away hands off. They can do with that gift whatever they want. But the parable of the talents doesn't paint a picture of a man, a master who gave gifts. It's a master who put an investment in those people. And when you put an investment in something, you have a, a, a reasonable expectation of some kind of return on your investment. And so that's what we were talking about last week. So what I want to do now is just, just talk a little bit about that investment. And how do we, what do we do? How can we work with that to make sure that we can give the master back some kind of return on the investment that he's given into us. Um, anyone ever seen that show Mythbusters? 
Mythbusters, yep. Yeah? Uh, who likes Mythbusters? Just out of interest. It tells me something about you as people. Okay, fair enough. So, so Mythbusters was about, they would take these popular myths, they'd do these experiments, and they would bust, either, either, either the myth was true or it was busted, it was gone. And uh, so what I want to do today is I want to just give you, 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 you some, some, some myths. I want to bust some myths about that investment that's in um, your life. Before I do, just as a matter of interest, let me bust some other myths. Um, number one, you know the red cloth that the bull rider uses, how he does this with the, the red cloth? Everyone know that? And then the bull charges and he, ole! And he goes again, ole! You know that? The bull riders in Spain? Did you know what? We've been told that they're attracted to the colour red, correct? Guess what? Let me bust that myth. They're not attracted to the colour red. They're red-green colourblind. Bulls are colourblind, red-green. They're attracted to the movement. There you go. Bet you didn't know that. And if you did, don't say you did. Just go, wow, Alan, you're amazing. How'd you find that out? I'll tell you later. But myth number one, myth number two. How many of you have been told goldfish have a three-second memory? Who's seen the ads where they, they go, oh, it's you again. Oh, it's you again. Oh, it's you again, and they keep swimming around. Well, apparently, they don't have three-second memories. They can have a memory of up to five months. Did you know that? Hands up if you knew that. Myth busted. Boom, there you go. Second one. You're learning something today. This is awesome. Number three. The myth is that we only use about 10% of our brains. Did you know that it's not true? Apparently, most of your brain is active nearly all of the time. I'm going too fast for Leslie. Fact or myth or not? Is that a myth? Am I going too fast? Yes, I am. True. I'll slow it down for you, Leslie. Number four. Who's ever been told they'll get a cramp if they go swimming after eating? And all the children said, yes, did you know what? And I'm not going to say mum and dad are wrong. I'm not saying that. So children, block your ears. It's not true. It's actually not true. Did you know that? You can eat and swim, and, and, and it doesn't actually give you cramps if you eat and swim. But we've been raised to believe that. Apparently, that's actually a biological myth. It doesn't work that way. There you go. But if mum and dad say don't swim after eating, you do what mum and dad say. And the fifth one, touching a toad will give you warts. Who's been told that? You touch a frog or a toad, you get warts. Who, who grew up believing that? Yeah? No? Yep, yep. You know what? Not true. It's absolutely not true. It's a myth. It's been debunked. It's not true. So there's five things that you believed, uh, or most of you probably believe, that we've been told for years, not true at all. So now what I want to do is give you five more things about that investment in your world. You can call it a gift. You can call it a talent. You call it whatever you will, but we know it's an investment. It's something God put in you with a reasonable expectation of a return. And I'll just go through these really, really quick. Five quick myths about the gifts, the talents, the investment in your life. Number one, you don't need to name it. You need to use it. You don't need to name it. You need to use it. How many people do you know spend their whole life trying to name whatever that gift or talent is on their life? Like once you name it, then you can really make a difference with the thing that's on your life. If you go back to the 80s, there were a plethora of books written about gifts and talents and, and early 90s and everybody had a book about it and how to find your gift and how to discover your talent and the emphasis was on trying to find out what that particular thing was that was on your life to the point where we ran around trying to chase knowledge about something and forget God, the goal is not to know about it or name it. The goal is to use it. The goal is to go and do it. You can be doing something that you don't have a name for, but you can't name something you're not doing. And if you did, the name would be nothing. You're doing nothing. So the goal is not to name it. The goal is to actually use it. If you go back to the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, the one talent man knew exactly what he had. But look how it turned out for him. He knew what he had. But he didn't do anything with what he had. So it's not about naming. It's not about having a tag or a label. When we lived in India, this, it was amazing how many people in India would come up to me at different, we go to conferences or meetings, and they would have a card, a business card. And they would hand me the card, and it would say, such and such, such and such, profit to the nations. That was their card. That was their label. They would say, this is what I am. I've named it. My gift is I'm a prophet to the nations. And, and I would, would, they would give me this card, blah, blah, prophet to the nations. And I'd give it to them and say, oh, really? Uh, prophet to the nations? So, so, so um, you know, where, what, what sort of ministry are you involved in? Oh, no, nothing. Okay, what church are you connected to? Oh, none. Okay, so which nations have you been to to prophet? None. It's like, but it doesn't matter. I've got a card that tells you that I'm a prophet to the nations, so I've made it because the card said it. I've been able to label that thing on my life, so I've made it. It means nothing. There are many people sitting in this room right now, and you are already moving and doing things. Hey, check out my shoes. Can everyone see them? 
Now, how cool are they? Honestly, they are cool. I don't care whether you recognize it or not. They're cool. Now, here's what happened. I bought them last year. Went to a shop with Jackie. I needed a pair of nice shoes. I said, I just want some white shoes I can wear. And so she said, oh, look, there's some over there in the shop. Went over there. It was innocuous and quick and la di da as that. There's some shoes. Walked in there, grabbed them, tried them on. Yeah, they're, they're like the ones I want, and I bought them. Well, you know what I found out? Let me give you some facts about my shoes. And I didn't know this at the time when I bought them. These are what they call Air Force Ones. Right? Anyone ever heard of Air Force Ones? They've actually got a name. Who would have thought that shoes have a name? I mean, isn't a shoe a shoe? But no, shoes have names now, like cars. It's the Ford this and the Ford that. Now we've got shoes with labels and tags. Can you fly in them? I can fly in them if I want to. You should see me run in them. I move like the wind. Anyway, irrelevant. And so these are uh, what they call Air Force Ones, Nikes. They have, have repeatedly always been ranked in the top 10 sneakers list. Year after year. Did you know there's a Grammy Award for sneakers, apparently, too? So there's a top 10, there's a list of sneakers, and they're ranked every year the best sneakers. These have made the top 10 consistently. Last year, the year I bought them, they were ranked number one in the world. Now, here's the thing. I had no idea what I was wearing and what I was walking in, but I was walking in them anyway. You can be walking in something and not know exactly what it is. The point is not, I didn't have to know what they were called. The point is I was already walking in them. And when it comes to that investment in your life, I'll guarantee you this, everybody in this room, I bet you you are already walking in it, even if you don't know what it is. You're already walking in it. There are things you're already doing just because you don't have a spiritual label for it. You don't recognise that that's an investment from heaven into your life. There's a gift, a talent, an investment. Call it whatever you want. I was already walking in Air Force Ones before I ever knew what they were. And I'll guarantee you, as far as the gifts and the investment in your life, most of you are doing the same thing right now as we speak. How many gifts are there, by the way? You know, Depending on, on which author's book you read, um, um, you'll go anywhere from nine gifts right up to, I think, the most I've read is about 32 gifts. Anyone read books on gifts and stuff? They'll, they'll say somewhere between nine and somewhere between 32. Different authors will have different opinions. It amazes me that God is creative enough to put 7.8 billion people on planet Earth, but he can only come up with 32 gifts. Isn't that amazing? 7.8 billion individual people with their own DNA and their own personalities and their own this and their own that, but apparently God could only come up with 32 gifts. So if you can't find a name in that list of 32 for what you do, maybe it's not a gift. What a load of baloney. What a load of rubbish. 32 gifts. Eh? If it's not mentioned in there with a particular name, then it's not a real gift. I, I think that the author of some of these documents, I think Paul would be pulling his hair out if he thought that we took 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 12, I think it is, uh, uh, 12 or 13, where he talks about the gifts. I think he'd pull his hair out if he thought, you guys think I wrote that because that's all there is? Are you serious? Are you serious? Keep in mind, Paul was writing to a bunch of people who were already moving in a bunch of things. He was just writing to them going, blah, 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 blah. They weren't sitting there going, oh, we didn't know that. Now we've got a name for what we're doing. It doesn't matter about the name. It doesn't matter about the label. If somebody says to you, what's your gift and talent, and you can't put a name to it, who cares? The point is not that you'd be able to name it and label yourself. The point is that we actually be doing something with the stuff that's on our life. Knowing stuff doesn't really make a difference. It's when we start doing things that a difference is made. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this question. What is it right now that you could be doing to produce kingdom fruit in the world around you? What is it you could be doing right now? Could you pick up a phone and encourage somebody who's having a hard time? Some people are great at encouraging. It comes natural to us. We just like to do it. We could can, can pick up a phone, send a text message, go and have a coffee with somebody and encourage them. Maybe you could go and mow somebody's lawn. Maybe you could do their washing. You just love doing things practically and helping people. Who cares whether you can name the gift? Just go and start doing it. That's something you know you can do. You know it produces fruit. Go and do it. Just start doing some of the stuff. You could fix somebody's car. Maybe you've got a mechanical nouse and it just comes natural to you. I'm sure there are people uh, with problems with their cars that can't afford to take them to mechanics. So why don't you just use that skill, that talent, that ability and go and help somebody fix a car. Can you make somebody a meal? Maybe you're, you're, you're somebody that loves to cook and, and loves to know that when someone's going through a hard time, the last thing you need to worry about is what you're going to feed your family tonight. Let me take care of that. Here's a meal. You can do that. You can do that without having a label of, oh, I have a gift of hospitality. Oh, I don't have a gift of hospitality. I do have, I don't know. Just make a meal for someone if they need a meal. You could visit somebody in hospital. Maybe you can go and put a smile on the face of somebody. You could put aside some deliberate, focused, specific time to pray for somebody. Not just sit down and, and, and hope, but no, no, I'm going to put half an hour aside. I'm going to pray for you, Sue. That's what I'm going to do. I want you to know for 30 minutes I'm going to pray for you. Push into heaven on behalf of Sue. 
You could give some time to a local charity or a group. You could put some time into, into kids. You could put your hand up and go and grab Nick and say, I want to get involved in kids' church. I want to help bring Jesus to a, a, a generation, a young generation. You could give financially. Maybe you've got a gift to create money and, and, and you know what? You don't need a word from God, whatever. You could just go, hey, I've got this gift here. I'm a generous person. I could give a bit more. You don't know. The point is this. What can you do right now? What can you commit to start doing right now that's going to bring fruit for the kingdom of God? The idea is just do it. Your label doesn't produce fruit. Your actions do. Your label does not produce fruit. Your actions do. Jesus didn't say you'll know them by their explanations. He said you'll know them by their fruit. And fruit comes by doing. Number two, really quickly. Gifts, talents, call them whatever you want. They don't grow by grace. You need to develop them. You need to develop them. The one talent man did nothing with what he had and how did that turn out for him? He did zero with what he had and how did that turn out for him? Nothing happened. But the other two, they did something with what they had. And what happened? Something happened. There was fruit produced. There was progress. There was something made. Now, it's a shame we, we no longer encourage people to get better. We live in a world now where instead of trying to, 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 to tell people to get better, we're just lowering the bar, making the playing field even so everybody gets a medal. Everybody gets this. Everybody gets that. Instead of encouraging and challenging people to get better, we just lower the bar. Instead of saying, no, I want you to reach for this, no, we'll bring it down. It's a little bit of, I guess maybe that's a little bit of what I was talking about before, even within faith. Instead of encouraging people to holiness, we'll just rule the bar down. Instead of encouraging people to produce fruit, we'll just lower the bar down. Instead of encouraging people to pray, we'll just bring the bar down and, and kind of find a place, well, that's not really that important. Instead of encouraging people to spend time in the Word, we'll bring the bar down and go, well, it's not really that. You hear someone on a Sunday, that's enough, that'll do. We just keep lowering the bar. Instead of encouraging people to work harder and get better, it seems more important for a person to feel like they've achieved something than to actually achieve it. It's the world we live in at the moment. God never gives us anything fully developed. Your body was not fully developed. All the mothers said, praise God. Praise God when they were born, they weren't 18 years of age coming out as they are right now. Praise God that they started like this and, and then once they came out, then they had to do things to grow and develop. God gives us nothing fully developed. Our brains weren't fully developed. Our bodies weren't fully developed. Our desires weren't fully developed. Our intellect wasn't fully developed. Our ability to talk was not fully developed. Our eyesight wasn't fully developed. These things develop as we go on. It's the same with the investment and the gifts and the talents and things in your life. We need to learn to develop them. They don't grow by grace. You're saved by grace, but you grow through effort and putting in the time and the energy and the work. That's just the way it is. Even with Christianity, your, your relationship with God doesn't just grow by grace. You enter the kingdom of heaven by grace, but once you get in there, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's a role that we play in developing, and when it comes to that investment that God's put in your life that he wants you to use to give him a reasonable return on that investment for the kingdom of God, we need to be okay with, in, with developing that. We need to know that we need to develop that. Growth is intentional. Growth is never, ever accidental. Caleb was telling me the other day, my son, he's, he's living up at Southport, and there's a guy there, right? And he started a coffee thing, a little sort of hole-in-the-wall type coffee shop up at Southport. And so Caleb uh, was having a chat with him, and this guy shared this story with Caleb. He said how, how he just so loves coffee, and he so wanted to be the best at grinding and making. His goal was the perfect cup of coffee that he did a degree... He did a degree to learn about coffee granules and grinding and so on to learn exactly what is the absolute perfect amount of number of granules to go into a certain size of cup to give you the exact perfect coffee according to all the science of it all. He did a degree to learn how to make a good cup of coffee. Why? Because he, he had a passion and a gift on his life for making coffee and so he wanted to develop it to the point where he went and did a degree on how to make a cup of coffee. That's an investment into that gift or that talent that he's got in his life. That shows me that guy's serious about producing fruit with that thing that's in him because he put time and energy into develop it. And I think many of us, we don't probably think about that. We just think that God's given us a gift, it'll just work. Why? Because we're Christians. I'm a believer, so it's just going to work. But it doesn't work like that. God wants us to develop those things that are on our life. Those things that we know when we do them, they have potential to produce kingdom fruit. Develop those things. Spend some time getting better at some of that stuff. Growth is intentional. It's not accidental. Uh, if you go and have a look at, at David, and David was called, everyone know the story of David, he was called into the courts of King Saul and he was called in to play 
music. Remember that? He was playing music. Um, uh, when King Saul was having a tough time, they wanted some music, and so they called David in. Now listen to what they said about David. First Samuel chapter 6, uh, 16, verse 14 to 18 says this. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre, someone who can play the harp. He'll play when the evil spirit comes and you'll feel better. And so Saul says to his attendants, yep, go and do that. He says, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. And one of the servants answered, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play. He knows how to play. The liar. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. I want you to notice, and the Lord is with him was the last thing they mentioned. And I think sometimes we think, well, because the Lord is with us, we'll just tag on the world. Because the Lord is with me and I've got this gift, I'll just become great at it. No, you have to work at it. You have to exercise it and you have to find ways to develop the gifts and talents on your life. The guys that were given the talents, the one that didn't work on it didn't come out so good. The ones that did work on it, that did do something with it, that did develop, they were the ones that came out with fruit for the kingdom of God. And I think that, that, that sometimes as a church, sometimes we can just sit back and rest on prayer and reading a Bible and everything will be right. But I believe that God put that investment in me and he's put an investment in you to make a difference for the kingdom of God. But we've got to be prepared to put a little bit of time and energy in and to develop and to get better at whatever that thing is. Is it possible that you could be better at what you do than you currently are? Is it possible? And if the answer is yes, then why don't you put some time in to developing your gift? Why don't you read a book about that gift? Why don't you listen to a podcast that's going to help you develop and grow in that gift? Why don't you talk to somebody who has that, who's further down the track, and get them to invest in you and help you develop that gift? We've never had more access to more information than we do today. There's never been more access to learning and education now, and it doesn't even have to cost you a cent. But we can be developing that gift in our life. If we sit back, you know what's going to happen? We'll get to 60, 70, 80 years of age, we'll look back and we'll wonder why God, that gift, that prophetic word, that, that thing that you placed inside of me, nothing happened all that time, God. Why didn't you do anything? And God will look at us and go, ah, why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you do anything? Well, because God, we just expect you to breathe on it and it'll just all happen for us because we're Christians. But yet that's not what we read in these ancient narratives. There are so many things where believers are told not what to believe, but they're told what to do. And what we need to do with that gift and talent. Let me tell you something. The guy that stands up here every Sunday morning, how many of you were here when Daniel first got up on stage with me to lead worship? Who's left from back in those days when Daniel first got up? One, two, three, about four of us. And I remember back, back, back in the day when Arise started, you're glad you're here now. If you've landed recently, you have landed to a great group of worship uh, people, all right? But when, if you came the first time, you would have had me on a guitar, just me and my guitar, like the old Slim Dusty album, me and my guitar. And I'm up there and I'm playing. <laughs> and then one day, Ruth happened to let slip accidentally, accidentally on purpose, that her husband could play a guitar. He was never going to say nothing. He didn't want to tell me. And so it took a little while to say to Daniel, <coughs> okay, Daniel, why don't you come on up stage with me? And he just didn't want to. So I said, how about the first time we start it, you jump up there and we'll turn your sound down, but just get used to being up there. And I could tell that it was a bit nerve-wracking and unsure about it. But you know what? Here's the thing. He did it. It was something he could do to develop that gift at that point where he was at right then. He did that. And then before you know it, as time goes on, um, he, he starts turning the guitar up and then he starts leading a song or two and then now you've got a guy standing up here and I can say this with all uh, sincerity, that guy that you're standing up here is the result of a human being who developed the gift on their life. Didn't, didn't sit back, pray, read a Bible and say, God, you make it happen. He has worked hard and developed the gift on his life and we are benefited by the gift that he's developed. Amen? It's the truth. It's the truth, Daniel. Number three, really quickly. God doesn't want your gift. He wants the fruit that it produces. How many of you ever heard that one? Oh, I'm just giving my gift to God. Come and give your gift to God. God doesn't want your gift. He wants the fruit that comes from the gift. <laughs> hey? He doesn't want the gift. 
He wants the fruit that is produced from the gift. So many people sit back and go, oh, well, it's God's gift, and if you want me to do something with it, I'm in your hands, Lord. You'll just make it happen. And God's going, no, I, I put an investment in you. I gave you the gift. I don't want the gift. What I want is the talents that come at the back end of it when you use the gift. I want fruit for the kingdom from you using the gift. Don't give me back the gift, and don't use me as an excuse why you feel like you can't use the gift. What I'm saying to you is go and use the gift. Find the context, whatever it is. Use the gift. I want the fruit. I don't want the gift. I gave you the gift. How many of you parents sitting here on Christmas Day, you want to go, here, Jordan, here's a present for you, and I'll give Jordan a pair of socks. And so Jordan unwraps it, and there's this beautiful pair of yellow and pink and purple socks, and he doesn't like them because he hates the colour, but because I gave him to him, he's grateful for it anyway. So he loves the sock, goes, thanks, Dad. He says, I've got a present for you too. Walks into the room next door, puts the purple socks on some wrapping paper, wraps it up, comes straight back out, and gives me the same thing back. Who'd be happy about that? Oh, amazing. I don't want that back, Jordan. I want you to use that. I want you to do something with it. And God doesn't want you to give back to him the gift he gave to you. He wants you to develop and use it. And he wants the fruit that comes from you using it. God wants the fruit from the gift. He does not want the gift back. Number four, quickly finish up. God doesn't anoint your gift. He anoints you. Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to heal the broken heart, blah, blah, blah. Who had he anointed? The preaching? The broken hearted, the healing part? The, no, Jesus starts by saying he's anointed me. And this is where holiness is really important. This is where walking with intimacy before God is important because the anointing of God comes upon people. God anoints people. God anoints people. So the way I live matters. It does. It doesn't matter in terms of God's love and acceptance of me. Because God loves me wholeheartedly, undeniably, junk and all. But in terms of, of getting the maximum out of me, the maximum production, the use of that gift, that talent, that thing, that investment, that return, there's an obligation for me to live right before God. In, in Timothy... Paul writes this to Timothy 2, 20 and 21. He says, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for special purposes, some for common. Now we read that and think, okay, so, so you're either made for a special purpose or you're made for a common purpose. But then he goes on, he says this, Those who cleanse themselves from the latter, these things that he's going to talk about, which really come back to just living right before God. He said, Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. In other words, in a house there are common things and there are special things. You decide what you want to be. You decide. Do you want to cleanse yourself? Do you want to walk right before me? Do you want to, want to, want to get your heart in the right place and your life in the right place so that I can anoint you to go and do the stuff? Or do you not? It's okay. You're still in the house. Both vessels are still in the house. They're both there, and they've both got a purpose. But he puts it back on the individuals. He says, what do you want to do? Do you want to press in? Do you want to walk right? Do you want to be intimate? What do you want? It's up to you. I'll love you either way, and you're in the house either way. What purpose do you want? What purpose do you want? And the last one. God doesn't determine your fruitfulness. You do. God doesn't determine your fruitfulness. You do. You do that by what you do with it. None of us in this room determine what we start with, but we can determine what we finish with. And if there's an overriding message I get out of the parable of the talents, it's that you may not have determined what you started with, but you can determine what you finish with based on what you do with what you have. Based on what you do with what you have. Some of us didn't have the best start in life. Some of us might have come about in circumstances that we wish didn't happen. But in terms of the context of my life, I have what I have. And I've just got to decide what do I do with what I have? Do I do something productive with it? Do I make the most of it? Do I move forward with it? Do I make right decisions? Do I, do, do I, do I charge on with God? What do I do with that? Because if there's one overriding message, it's this. They didn't determine what they started with. The master said, you have one, you have two, you have five. It was his prerogative to dish out. But what they did with it determined where they landed at the end. So that none of us are without, so that we're all without excuse. 
God has given us all an equal playing field. We've all got an equal playing field. So you might not determine what you started with, but you can determine where you end, how far you go, where you land at the end of the day. I've got two friends of ours, and um, both of them are incredibly talented um, uh, uh, rugby league players. And I won't mention names because I don't want anyone to know. But bottom line, um, our, 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 one of our kids grew up playing rugby league with them from this big. They played with both of them for years and years and years, both incredibly talented. One of the kids was so naturally talented. He was, one, he was that kid in sport as he grew up. If you wanted to win, just give it to him and he'll just score the try from anywhere around the field at any point. So you're never going to lose a game because even if you're down by 20, just make sure you give him the next three passes. He'll score 1,000 points for you. He was that good. There was another guy uh, as well who wasn't quite that naturally talented, but he just plugged away, turned up to every training session, listened to the coach, chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. He was never the star, wasn't the one making all the rep sides while this other guy was. One of them now, I, I watch him run around uh, on a Wednesday night down there in Ballon the Touch when he can be bothered to turn up. He was the guy with all the talent. The other guy, I watch him every weekend on TV as he runs around in the National Rugby League. Playing first grade rugby league right now, living the dream. Yet he was never the most talented. He didn't start out with, with as much as what the others had. But he just plugged away and he had a gift and a talent. He developed it and he worked with it and he produced something. And now here he is with this massive platform, living the dream. And the other guy's running around down the park here and he had way more, way more to start with. I'll tell you what, way more to start with than this other kid. But he did something. This other kid did something with what he had. We don't determine what we start with. But we can determine where we finish. Proverbs 22, 29 says, Do you see someone skilled in their work? They'll serve before kings. They'll not serve before officials of low rank. Do you see someone skilled? Someone who's taken that gift, that talent, and they have developed it. Someone who's taken that gift and talent and done something with it. Someone who's taken that gift and talent and pushed it as far as they can and had that attitude that this is an investment in my world and because it's an investment, I'm going to be very strategic and smart in how I make sure that the one that invested it gets a return at the end of the day. You find that person. He says, you see that person, they'll, they'll, they'll get platform, they'll get opportunity, they will stand in places of influence. But the person who sits back and just has the Doris Day, whatever it will be, will be attitude with that deposit in their life may not necessarily land there. See, I think if you look around the world today, I, I, I wonder whether the people that look like they're the best in the world in their fields, I don't think they probably actually are the best. They're just the ones that were prepared to put in the time, the energy to develop what they had. But they might not necessarily be the best in the world, but they're recognised as the best in the world because of the investment that they put back into that which was invested into them. And I guess the challenge is this, every seed that is inside of you has the potential to grow. Everything that God has placed in you has potential to produce kingdom fruit. It was never given to you just for you. Go back to Genesis 12, the Abrahamic blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. And the greatest way we can be a blessing out there is by taking that which the master's deposited in us, working with it, developing it, and actually doing something with it so that when he comes back, just as he did in the story, that they said, hey, here's what you gave me, but hey, here's what I produced with that. And what did the master say? He was so excited, he said, man, that's awesome, what I gave you and you give me back that, I'm gonna double the whole kit and caboodle because you're the kind of person that I like to build on. You're the kind of person I like to use. You're the kind of person I give platform to. You're the person I give influence to. You're the person I open doors for. You're the person because I know I'm gonna get a great return back on what I put into your life, amen? And I want to be that person. I hope you do too.